Good evening and welcome to the April 13th meeting of the Commission on the Status of Women. Ms. Sadad, may we have a roll call, please? Certainly. Commissioner Katafian? Yes. Commissioner Lamel? Commissioner Malakian? Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Manasarian? Here. Commissioner Monocut? Here. Commissioner Pillsbury? Here. Commissioner Sobey? Commissioner Walker? Chair Devine? Here. Next item, please. A brief report regarding the posting of the agenda. The agenda for the April 13th meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside of City Hall on or before April 10th, 2009. Thank you. Next item. Next item on the agenda is introductions and presentations. First, we have um, a replay of the video that was played at the Jewels as comments from the Speaker of the As California Assembly, the Honorable Karen Bass. Thank you. As you know, last month we did hold our Jewels of Glendale luncheon, our fifth annual, and we were pleased to receive a video address from the Honorable Karen Bass, Speaker of the California Assembly. For those of you who couldn't make it um, to the banquet, uh, we would like to um, present this video. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Bass, Speaker of the California State Assembly. While I'm unable to join you in person today, I absolutely wanted to send my congratulations and best wishes to today's honorees and to all the jewels of Glendale. These awards were established to recognize women who through strength, courage, and persistence have become strong positive role models for the community. That's certainly true of the two women we honor today. Through her work with Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Juanita Watts has helped tackle two of the biggest health challenges facing California women today, diabetes and hypertension. Louise Garside has devoted her career to launching and sustaining the careers of others, providing strong mentoring and leadership opportunities for women in the community. These women and the women who make up and support the Glendale Commission on the Status of Women truly meet the dictionary definition of jewels, strong and beautiful. In these challenging times, it is important for us to continue to support each other and help each other. When I was sworn in as Speaker of the California Assembly, I knew I was only there because I stood on the shoulders of others. Thank you to our two honorees and thank you to everyone supporting this great event for making room on your shoulders for the women leaders to come. Thank you. Can we please make note that uh, Commissioner Malakian and Commissioner Walker have joined us. Next item, please. To address the commission, this is uh, Sergeant Tim Feely from Glendale Police. He's in charge of our assaults division and will be talking about the issue of sex assault in Glendale. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as Lana said, my name is Tim Feely. I'm a sergeant with the Glendale Police Department. Uh, my detail is, is called the violent crimes detail and we deal with all, um, all violent crimes, domestic violence, sexual assaults, child abuse, elder abuse, those, those type of crimes. And, and today I'm here to talk about the, the sexual assaults. Um, there was some concern because our stats went up last year from 2000 to 2008, uh, 2007 to 2008. Um, we saw a rise in sexual assaults that were reported. Um, as I was explaining to people who have asked in the past, the, these, these statistics are kind of deceiving. We didn't have people um, preying on women going through the streets of Glendale, and, and that was the cause of this rise. Um, in almost 99% uh, of these cases, the offender was known to the victim um, as far as it, it being some type of relationship. So these, these cases were very much based on relationships um, that the, the victim had with the suspect. Um, and then there were the other, some of these cases were actually reclassified as suspicious circumstances based on the, the facts that were found out after the cases were investigated. Um, so I hope the, the council doesn't feel that the, the Glendale is any less safe because of the rise in, in numbers that we had. Um, it, in my viewpoint, I don't see that at all. I see it still as a very safe city. And, and the fact that these, these numbers went up doesn't, doesn't change my feeling. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that, that the council has for me in the cases that we handle or um, more specifically what 
we educate the public about? I, I well, I, I think I have a statistic here from okay. 1995, and it said that it reports that we had 230 rapes in Glendale. Do you have an exact number of how many? 230 we rapes in 2005? Ni no, in 1995. Oh, I'm sorry, 1995. I, I, Do you I have it? What is the? That. What is the? I'm sorry, I don't have the exact numbers going back that far, Chair, but I do know that would be an inaccurate number. I'm not sure where you got that from because we've never had more than 10 reported rapes. One of the issues that um, we are all aware of when we work in this field is that there is a lot of underreporting when it comes to sex assault. So part of the reason that you might see an increase in the calls is actually increased awareness on the part of people about what might constitute a sexual assault, and so therefore the police will get called out to come and investigate on something that might not have been called out to the police before. So that actually in some ways you want to see a rise before you'll see a decrease in both sex assault and domestic violence crimes. I, I absolutely agree with that. The, the, that number is incredibly high. I, I, don't, I would disagree with that number. Um, we have never seen those, those type of numbers with any type of rapes or sexual assaults. However, I, I, I agree with Lana that, that one of the reasons that we've seen the increase is more awareness. People feel more willing to call the police, um, which is, is a great sign, I think, that people feel that they can reach out to the police department. Um, I pride myself in the detail that I have currently working for me, that they can interview anybody, that they can talk to people, and that, that people feel comfortable speaking with them, that you don't have that um, impression of the, the police being these big blue meanies that are, are not compassionate with, with the people that we talk to. And um, the, the people that are currently working in this detail are, are very compassionate. You know, we, we come across as very low-key, very uh, understanding and, and wanting to hear what, what the situation, what, what occurred. So um, I think that is one of the, the positive things when we see a rise is that people feel more willing to come forward to the police department and talk to us. I think one of the best things that we can do and what we do in our detail is, is educate. Uh, I mean, that, that's really going to be one of the best um, tools for the community is to really educate the people that are, that are being assaulted. Uh, these programs that empower women and uh, strengthen the young women in our community to know when to make the right decisions and when to not only make the decision at that moment, at that night that this is occurring, but also the next day when they come forward to us and, and talk to us and give and, and gives them the strength to continue on through this process. Because this is not an easy process. When they when somebody goes through the the judicial system, it's it's tough. You know, and we try to, to be there as much as we can and, and hold their hands as they go through working with advocates. But again, that's where a partnership with the advocates groups is key because when we have advocates that want to work with the law enforcement entity, it, it, it really improves our chances of getting convictions and getting a positive uh, effect in the community. So I think enforcement through education is really key. And if, if we're able to educate and empower the women in the community, I think that's when you're really going to see a difference in these, these sexual assaults. I was wondering if you could tell the viewers at home what it's like to call the police if something happens, what they can expect, and um, how you are there for them you know how do they know they're safe if they call you absolutely and, and, it, and it again it's a tough decision for them to make um, as far as walking through step by step the initial call would come into our dispatch dispatch would then send a patrol unit out to the call um, they're going to be greeted by the the uniform officers the uniform officers will be the first responders to the location and depending on the severity of the crime uh, you might have a detective call out just last night we were called at three in the morning regarding a, an assault crime and so we roll out as a as detectives, so you you, you kind of have a transition from the the uniformed officers to the uh, the, the plain clothes detectives that would come in dressed in suits like I am, um, who would then interview the victim, talk about the the incident that occurred. Um, the other step that's going to happen again, depending on the severity, is they could be uh, sent down to uh, VIP, which is uh, a, a branch of, of county hospital where a sexual assault. Um, kit is, is com completed where a sexual assault exam is conducted on, on the victim um, and then from that process they would usually come back to the police station where they would talk to us again uh, be re-interviewed uh, we make an effort to offer them to get an advocate if they want an advocate anybody can be their advocate as well if they say you know what I want my best friend she's you know who I want in this interview that's fine you know those are things that we can work with the only time that that we you know talk to them is if we're doing some type of undercover operation we might say hey you know we need to make a you know a certain um, call or whatever with with just a, a victim present but um, 
that's that's kind of the first step but then there's there's still a long process after that we then present the case to the district attorney once we've conducted our whole investigation the district attorney then decides whether to file charges or not they might sometimes ask to re-interview the victim they might call the victim into the DA's office so they can re-interview and, and talk more about the case um, and then again the, they're they're the ones that make the decision whether or not to file charges if charges are filed we have preliminary hearing um, a lot of times we can testify for them um, it's called Prop 115 where we can actually get up as the detectives and testify um, based on the, the statements that were given to us but eventually they will become a, a jury trial and during jury trial the victim will have to get up on the stand and be questioned about the incident that occurred and you know have to go through that process along the way we, we maintain contact with the victim and make sure that they they know the steps that are coming so that it's not out of the blue okay I just got a subpoena I gotta go to court we tell them We'll usually call them up before, when we get a, a subpoena, tell them that this is a court date. A lot of times we'll drive them to court, sit in, their, sit in court with them, drive them back, just so it kind of it softens the blow of this process. It's a very tough thing to, to reveal this most intimate of crimes in front of complete strangers. And so it kind of helps to have that, at least that person that you know, you've seen, you're familiar with. Um, the DA does the same thing so that the DA is familiar with this person that you know at least that that way they, they know the questions that you know they feel comfortable with the questions that are becoming coming at them um, I mentioned the advocates and that's that's really key because if we have people that understand the, the police process understand what we're going for they help work together to so we can achieve a common goal um, a lot of times we'll see a a, a separation where where an advocate is not working with the police department or the police department is not working with the advocate and things are bad that way um, so we, we really try hard to work with the advocates explain our, our position because a lot of times people don't understand hey why are you asking these these uncomfortable questions and I understand they're very uncomfortable questions but we need to know those things before we get to court because that's the last thing we want is to be have the victim up there on the stand and and now be asked that embarrassing question and, and we're caught off guard by, by her answer so one um, other quick question. Do you absolutely. do anything to protect the victim from the perpetrator during this process? Because as you say, most of the crimes are people that they know. Unfortunately, if they know the person, there's not, I mean, they already know who that person is. We will make every effort to get them restraining orders. Um, they're, they're usually the night of the event, if it's somebody they know, if it's either a, a spousal rape or something, that, um, a date rape, we'll get an emergency protective order that can be granted that night. Um, that way that person is put on notice that they're not allowed to contact them. Um, if the person is in custody, they're served with that order in custody, so they can't even call. And a lot of, these time, a lot of times these bad guys will try to violate that order. Um, and call the person from jail, but we're able to confirm that, verify that, and just add one more charge, so that that it actually helps helps give us more teeth when we're prosecuting these cases. So those are some of the the, the things that we can do. Um, but we do keep their, you know, if the the suspect does not know who they are, they're not entitled to that that information. Their their uh, victims are granted, you know, a certain amount of anonymity so that we don't re reveal their information. Um, you know, there's a certain amount that has to be revealed when we file the case, but that's it. Any other commissioners have questions? I Commissioner had a question, Mr. Sergeant. Do you have programs to educate the public about sexual assault or, like, you know, for the community, basically? We uh, we don't have a set program. Uh, we do, within my detail, have gone around to different groups, different schools, different uh, church groups, different, uh, a whole bunch of, uh, a myriad, uh, myriad of different um, organizations within the city. And we give kind of a public safety talk in a way it's mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we gear it towards the younger audience the children um, because again I, I really believe that if we educate at the younger level we really empower them to make the right decisions so we go through schools we have a uh, PowerPoint design just for kids to, to understand the dangers understand the decisions that they should make um, everyone's heard the you know the internet crimes against children um, those are those are a sex crime you know that's that those are sexual assaults that are occurring and and we belong to a task force a nationwide task force that helps um, work together with other law enforcement agencies so that we can combat that other facet of sexual assaults thank you any other questions commissioners walker um as you know probably prom is coming up right for a lot of our um senior 
high school students. Um, are there instances wherein some of these um, crimes, sexual crimes, occur, and that's been reported in our city? Through proms or yeah. dances? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, unfortunately, those things do happen. Um, that's a lot of times bad decisions are made at the, the get-go. People are going out, they're deciding to party that night, have too much to drink, and then bad decisions kind of flow from that. And that goes back to we have to start that foundation before that night. We can't that night say, hey, don't do anything wrong. We have to, before that time, give them the tools so that they feel strong enough to make the right decision before then. And it's the, the thing we've always heard, even when we were kids, is to be able to fight peer pressure. And it's very difficult. From a kid's standpoint, you want to be popular. You want to be liked. You, you don't want to be the person that's known as the, you know, the, the, the standoffish girl or boy and, and you want to be popular and so it's very difficult to make those right decisions but that's why you know we have these programs within Glendale I, I think the, the Rosie program is, is designed towards that to, to strengthen women um, same that the, the education that we give is designed to help children make the right decisions before that night and unfortunately we do have assaults that occur during those events and the, the best advice I can give is to to be ready to make the right decision you know have you know, kind of rehearse the right decision. If, if, if I'm confronted with my friend saying, hey, we got to go drink and we got to go do this and you have to go make out with this guy, what am I going to say to say no? How am I going to respond to this? And if they're prepared for that, they, they will be able to give a better answer than if that's the first time they've thought of that. They, they're not going to know what to say and they will most likely go with the flow. And so they have to know how to be strong and make the right decisions at that time. Mr. Dodd? To add to what Sergeant Feely is saying, one of the things that we want to emphasize is that right decision to not commit a rape is on the shoulders of the person who would be doing the raping, not necessarily the victim. So we don't want to think, we don't want to, I don't want to interpret Sergeant oh. Feely's uh, comments as bl blaming sort of the girls in the situation. I think he's talking sort of gender neutral language because as a city employee and as an officer, he sort of is trained to do that and he has to do that. But as the Women's Commission, it's important for us to understand that part of the conversation we're going to be having after this is to reframe this conversation conversation so the burden of sort of responsibility lays on the shoulders of the people who commit most of the crime. So it's not usual for women to rape, therefore we're talking about men's decisions in this particular instance. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I, my gist of what I'm trying to say is trying to prevent these things from even happening. Uh, and, and so no, I'm not putting any blame whatsoever on, on the victims or, or the, the, the girls that are confronted with these decisions. It's just that if I can prevent it from them even being put into a situation that where a guy can take advantage of them, that, that's my goal. Because that way the predator can't even go after that person. Um, but no, the, the, yeah, the, the, the crime being perpetrated is absolutely the offender's, you know, it's, it's his, his crime, not hers whatsoever. And that's a tough thing that we have to help the, the, the women understand. When we're interviewing them, there's a lot of feelings that, you know, conflicting feelings, whether it's guilt or shame or you know, everything that's going through their minds. And so we as investigators, one of our things that we try to do is make sure that they know that it's not their fault. This is not something that they did. They're not in trouble. We're here to help them. And once we get, I mean, that's really the first step. And until we can cross that barrier, you know, we're not really getting forward. So we have to really emphasize that to them. And I, I think, like I said, when I, when I speak about my detail, that's one of the first things we do when we step in there is, is make sure that they know that they're not in trouble. Because it's a scary place, being a police department. <laughs> So we explain the whole process to them, like you were asking about what, what happens. We'll tell them what's going to happen so that they know, so that they're not just scared. Because a lot of times you won't ask. You'll just, I guess I have to go over to this room. I guess I have to go to that room. And so we'll take them step by step. Hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. These are the questions we're going to ask. And we'll, we'll say from the get-go of why we're going to ask these questions and t say, I'm going to ask you some, some really tough questions, and this is why. And it, and it really helps. But, yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it has nothing to do with the victim as far as the the fault of this crime. Any other questions? Yes. Mr. Walker. Um, what happens if a minor is a victim of sexual assault um, or violence and then can the minor report directly or do they have to involve the parents and what are confidentiality issues involved? Um, absolutely, they can come straight to us. It's not something we have to involve the parents with um, initially. A lot of times we'll encourage them to to work with their parents because it's 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 a very tough process and if you have a, a young child that's going through this process alone it, it's very very difficult and so we are going to seek to kind of make sure that that family is united in some way so that they can work together but anyone can come in to, to report this crime no one has to to 
you know, come in with a parent, oh, I'm only, you know, 16 years old or 15 years old, I can't go to the police department. No, you can come in to the police department and tell us what happened, and we'll work with you and explain what's going on in the process. And they, and they can request that it be confidential and yes. involve the parents. Absolutely. Okay. And, and, I, and I understand that that's a very tough decision because sometimes, you know, they don't want their parents to know what happened. And, and for that idea of because um, they feel bad or guilty or, or shameful. And that, Not that, everybody that has really that open communication Absolutely. relationship with and, families. And you don't want your parents to know, yeah. I, and, and we understand that. And we'll work with, with children in those cases. Yes. Any other questions, Commissioner? Do you, do you have a phone number for either you guys or the rape crisis hotline or something you want to give to, you know? I, I didn't bring the, the rape crisis hotline number, but our number is, is uh, I'd be happy to give out for our detail that, that can answer any type of questions. Um, it's 818-548-3106, and that's to the violent crimes detail. and. These are the type of crimes we deal with. And, and a lot of times we'll field questions with people that are just curious of what happens. If this happened hypothetically, what would I do? And, and we'll be happy to walk them through it. Um, a lot of times we can tell this person has been victimized, and, and we'll try to encourage them to come forward because our goal is to get these guys off the street. We don't want them there. So we're going to try to work with the victims so that we can get the perpetrators so that they don't victimize somebody else. I mean, these people are, are predators. I mean, they... Rapists, anybody that commits sexual assaults, they're considered, they would be forced to register um, as a sex registrant. And the reason that law exists is because of the recidivism is of these type of crimes. These people continue to offend over and over again. So we want to do the best we can do to put that guy behind bars so that he's not able to victimize another person. And it's very tough for this one, per this one girl to, to be that crusader and take all this weight on her shoulders, but it's, it's really worthwhile a lot of times in order to get somebody else put off the streets to make sure that somebody else isn't victimized. And sometimes that's actually what gives the girl strength. Is like, you know what, I'm not going to let somebody else go through what I went through. And I'm going to make sure that this guy goes behind bars. And, and I, I really applaud that courage and that, that strength that they have. Um, Sergeant Feely, um, this is uh, for the Commission on the Status of Women. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and we have some programs that will be going on. Um, can you just tell me or tell the women that are watching, is there one bit of advice or that you would give to women um, as a police officer about sexual assault? Um, I think there's if a couple they things. they become a victim. I, I think, like, like Lana was alluding to, it's, it's not their fault. Um, if, they're, if they find themselves in this situation and something bad has happened, realize it's not their fault that... that what happened. It's the perpetrator's fault. He made that decision to, to violate that woman and that and they should understand that and feel that they can come forward to us um, and understand that, that the Glendale Police Department will work with them and is very compassionate and is, you know, really geared towards helping them out and, and going forward and prosecuting these cases. Um, and then as far as I think the, the younger audience, that those are great questions and, and for them it's to give them the strength to make the right decisions. Um, think about these scenarios before they happen. Have the courage to, to stand up and, and make those those decisions, not to put themselves in that in that situation. So, um, but that is in no way saying that it's their fault. It's just again giving them the tools to, to make the right decisions and and know that the Glendale Police Department is there to help them for every step of the way. Thank you. I have a question. Um, could you tell the public what is the website that people can go to to find out what sexual um, offenders are registered in their neighborhood? Um, the Department of Justice is the best site to go to. If you go to the uh, DOJ.org, um, it will actually have a, uh, a link on it that will take you directly to the sexual assault uh, sex registrants. And within that website, you can look for names of a person. If you know somebody that, that might be a, a perpetrator, uh, you can put in zip codes, you can put in addresses, you can put in a, a myriad of different searches so you can find out where these, these predators are. Um, I, I encourage all parents to do that. I think that's key for them, parents to understand what the dangers are within their, their neighborhoods, but not be thinking that that's the only person we have to, I don't want to cause any type of hysteria, but those aren't the only people we need to worry about. Y your, your children uh, need to know the, the right way to respond to, to stranger danger, for instance, you know, what to do if they, a stranger approaches them and, and always be able to make that decision. So I think in combination, looking at that, being aware of who's out there, as well as then educating your children. And, and that's a great way to, 
to segue into talking to your children about this is showing them this site on the web, showing them you know what what it is, where these people are, and then talking to them about you know what to do if a stranger approaches you, what to do if you you see somebody or your friends are encountered by this. So, so are some of those tips on your website? Um, on the Glendale Police Department's website, I don't know if there has if we have any on there. But the yeah. uh, the Department of Justice has a, a a whole bunch of tools that are that are available for for women and, and children. Okay. Another Any comments. Yeah. Another information is city dash um, slash data dot com, and per city it would list the number of offenders. And I'm looking at the city of Glendale here. There were 81 registered sex offenders living in Glendale in early 2007. Is that I, I think there's unfortunately a little bit more than that. Um, okay. I don't know if that site's accurate. <laughs> Wait, the, Department of Justice, <laughs> the Department of Justice is, is one of the most accurate sites. Um, we have some more than that. Uh, I think our number is around 150 uh, registered sex offenders within the city. And that, that can vary from from the, the really scary rapist that we, we think about when we think about a true sex offender to somebody that uh, um, had a relationship with an underage girl uh, a bunch of years back and is because of that a registered sex offender and it was a consensual relationship we've even had ones that are now married to that person but are a, a, a registrant and that's you know but it's just the way that system is the uh, so you, I don't want the city to go oh my gosh we have so many in the city we actually our program in Glendale is I would say one of the best we have uh, my detail deals with the the sex registrants and we have a uh, a designated hourly employee that that registers the individuals. So we have somebody there all the time that's that's registering these people. Uh, we stay on top of who our registrants are. If they don't register, we file for warrants so that we can go arrest them. A lot of times we'll do residence checks to make sure that they actually live at the locations that they say they live at. Um, so they get a lot of attention in Glendale, and I think that's one of the reasons that they they tend to behave themselves when they're when they're here because they know that that Glendale cares a little bit more than some of uh, the other places that they've lived in the past. So. Okay. Any other comments, questions, Commissioner Kadepian? Uh As compared with the uh, number of the uh, assaults that we will get, most of the people are from outside of Glendale. Do they live in Glendale or they, they come from outside? I think you have a little both. I, I think uh, a lot of the ones within uh, 2008 lived in Glendale because, again, they were when we're talking about the rapes, they were relationship-based, and so it was people that lived together or, or were dating. Um, but I, I didn't see, when I've reviewed all these reports, that we had any predators coming into our city to prey on the women within Glendale. It was, you know, a hodgepodge of, of people that live within the city as well as people that live without outside of the city. Any other questions, Commissioner yeah. Walker? Um, in your estimation, what areas can the Commission on the Status of Women uh, partner or assist with our mutual goals of trying to decrease sexual violence and assault in partnership with your department? Um, I think, again, through education, I think some of the programs you guys have that you've set up for young women within the city are excellent because I think that's what's really going to lower these numbers is preventing the situation from occurring in the first place. And if we can teach people how to how to uh, be strong and, and make the right decisions um, before anything even starts, you're really going to strengthen um, their ability to, to uh, not be a victim. Um, and, and working with the advocate groups, uh, I, you know, I keep referring to Lana, and I, I hope I'm not embarrassing her, but she's key, I think, in, in really relating our point of view to the commission a lot of times because she sees a lot of the cases I've gone to her before when we've had domestic violence cases where we've needed assistance in in getting uh, uh, somebody placed or getting uh, assistance outside of even the state on, on, a, on a certain case. And so I encourage all of you to feel free to call me and talk to me about questions or problems or, hey, we heard this concern. What 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 can we do to uh, to uh, get past this? And and once you we bridge that gap between us just being those guys over there in that police department and understanding who we are and, and the cases we actually investigate, I think that really helps. So um, please feel free to contact me, any of my detectives, uh, and, and we're very open as far as dealing with the commission. And like I said, Lana has been a real great resource as far as us communicating our, our ideas and, and our goals to you guys. Thank you, Sergeant Fuey. I know that the police department is always a presence at our march, uh, Take Back the Night march, and we appreciate that uh, greatly. And we'll continue to create programs of awareness for our community so that we can continue to um, maybe bring the numbers down to zero.
Great. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, for Thank you so me. much. Next item. Next speaker. Next item on the agenda is Dr. Shira Tarrant um, with a presentation called Serious Talk About Men's Violence. By way of introduction, I'd like to note that Dr. Tarrant is a nationally recognized expert in gender politics, feminism, pop culture, and masculinity. She's the author of Men and Feminism, When Sex Became Gender, and the editor of a provocative anthology, Men Speak Out, Views on Gender, Sex, and Power. She is currently co-editing Fashion Talks, Undressing the Power of Style, which is forthcoming. She, uh, Dr. Tarrant's work has appeared in multiple magazines uh, and peer-reviewed journals, including Women's Studies Quarterly, Genre Magazine, and the Women's Movement of Today, and Encyclopedia of Third, Third Way Feminism. Dr. Tarrant is the column editor for The Man Files at a popular blog called Girl with Pen. She's a frequently invited speaker at college campuses and other venues, and is quoted widely in print, TV, radio, and online media. Shira did grow up in Cleveland, Ohio, and lives in Southern California, where she teaches in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Cal State University, Long Beach. She has a PhD in political science from UCLA and has fond memories, according to her bio, of lounging on the grass at the, in the campus sculpture garden. So you're talking to some Trojans here, so be on alert. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I want to, first of all, thank Lana Haddad for inviting me to speak before the commission. And um, I'd like to look at the problem of sexual assault from a different angle than Sergeant Feely just did, and I thank him for all of his really important information. Um, we obviously, we know that we need education and resources and hotlines for women who have survived rape or any form of sexual assault. But what I'd like to suggest is that if we only focus on the women who are the survivors or the victims, we miss a crucial opportunity to address the problem. So I'm here tonight to make two points. My first point, number one, is that men's violence against women is a men's issue. And men's sexual assault against women is a men's issue. Men are the perpetrators in over 90% of sexual assault cases, and this is true whether the survivors or the victims are women, men, or children. That is not the same thing as saying over 90% of men are sexual assaulters. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but given that the vast majority of perpetrators are men, it's curious that we continue to talk about sexual assault as a so-called women's issue. These are women's issues, but we need to rethink this in order to address the problem more effectively. Men's sexual assault against women is a men's issue. We need to teach our men in our culture to make the right decisions not to rape. This brings me to my second point, which is prevention is the best solution. And I think that Sergeant Feely talked about this, but again, I'm going to talk about it from a different angle. The best way, the best way I know to solve a problem or to solve the problem of sexual assault is to stop it before it happens. In this case, this means getting men to stop assaulting. So how do we do that? I have three, I have lots of ideas, but three suggestions for consideration tonight. Number one, I suggest that we reframe the questions. So, for example, in cases like domestic violence, I know we're focusing on sexual assault, but in cases of domestic violence, for example, instead of asking questions like, why does she stay, we need to be asking, why does he abuse? In sexual assault cases, instead of asking what she did or how much she drank or what was she wearing, we need to ask, why did he rape? And we know that alcohol is involved in the vast majority of sexual assault cases, especially when, when the perpetrator and victim are known to each other, and yet we tend to focus on the, when women choose to drink. That is a legitimate concern, but there are usually two parties drinking. So if we know that alcohol is a risk factor in assaulting, we need to be looking at that issue. Number two, we need to rethink masculinity. And we need to rethink what we are taught about what it means to be a quote-unquote real man. As long as being a real man in our culture is equated with being tough, being hard, being aggressive, being violent, not backing down, then we're going to keep having problems in terms of male, male violence and sexual assault. And I direct your attention to any popular music video for examples of this kind. As long as pop culture re relentlessly shows images of men's sexual access to women's bodies, we will continue to have problems because pop culture teaches us about who we are and how we relate to other people, how we relate sexually, um, and this is the case for young women and for young men. 
um, and for grown women and for grown men. I want to emphasize that this is not a moral issue that I'm making, this is a political issue. Number three, we can be aware of the many excellent programs and resources that are developed to address issues of masculinity and violence prevention. There are a lot of men working in this area, and um, I, I think that it's really important that, it, that their efforts start to garner more mainstream attention. I want to mention a few of these programs and resources just as examples, and um, I have plenty more if the commission is interested afterwards. Um, one example, Jackson Katz, he's the author of The Macho Paradox, Why Some, Why Some Men, Women, and How All Men Can Help. Um, and he is the founder of the MVP program, which stands for Mentors in Violence Prevention. There's more information at jacksonkatz.com, K-A-T-Z. Number two, the Department of Defense, the DOD, just implemented a program in conjunction with the nationally based group called Men Can Stop Rape. So I think it's important that we're aware that at a federal level, um, the DOD is taking this issue seriously and implementing programs in um, addressing men in not assaulting before it ever happens. Um, a third example is, again, Men Can Stop Rape. They're holding a conference this week right now as I speak in D.C. Um, it's their first conference, and the focus is on men and women working as allies. We only have one man with us tonight. I hope that next year we have more so that we can have conversations across communities. Um, I think that will go a long way towards stopping the problem. Um, another resource is Voicemail Magazine. It's spelled M-A-L-E and they're available online at voicemailmagazine.org. They've been in existence for a long time, and there are a lot of resources and links available through them. I highly recommend them. Um, and finally, I want to um, mention that I'm working with a gentleman by the name of Joel Woods and Professor Abby Ferber of the Renaissance Men's Project to create regionally-based violence prevention programs that look at masculinity issues. Um, Right now, it seems like a lot of the programs being generated are along the I-95 corridor between New York and D.C. And, and the Northeast, and I'd like to see more of that activity happening in Southern California. We have the resources. Jackson Katz is locally based. Um, and um, to that end, just to, to finish, I'd like to make myself available and Joel Woods, I will volunteer him, um, make ourselves available to the commission to recommend strategies and program implementation in terms of speaking to men, speaking to young boys about what it means to be a boy in our culture um, and what it means to, ha to, to grow up with positive images of masculinity. Right now, the choices that we sort of get are you're either tough or, or you're you're a sissy. And there are a lot more options than that. There really are, and we need to have those conversations. Um, so when we talk about making right choices, we need to be talking to our boys and, and our men about making right choices not to assault. Um, and I think I'll end there, but like I said, I'm, I would like to make myself available to the commission for any further questions and resources that I could provide. Thank you. Hey, commissioners, any questions, comments? Commissioner Manasarian? I had a question. How do you deal with the pop culture portrayal of the masculinity? I mean, us as the community or the commissioners or the groups in the city, how do we deal with that? I mean, that is so pre prevalent right now. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I think what is, what one of the, it, it is, and it's, it's the main way we get information. I mean, forget about watching the 6 o'clock news. You know, the main <laughs> way most of us get information about who we are is pop culture. Um, and so I think that media literacy in the schools is tremendously important because we're bombarded with advertising, music video, music lyrics, TV shows, movies, billboards, all of that all of that is pop culture yet we aren't taught we're taught how to drive before we get a license. We're not taught how to understand media and what's, what we're being bombarded with. Um, and Media Education Foundation puts out a series of really excellent videos that and, and um, teaching tools that can be easily integrated into school curricula. Um, that for example, Tough Guys, G-U-I-S-E, looks at masculinity in popular film. And the second edition of that is out this fall. Um, not just in film, but in um, wrestling, in mixed martial arts, things like that. Um, Byron Hurt 
is an excellent, um, excellent resource in terms of pop culture and media literacy and looking at masculinity issues um, and sexuality and sexual assault. And he has a fantastic film called Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, and that's also produced by Media Education Foundation. So there are tools out there, and um, there are they make it real easy to you know for educators to okay. integrate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, Commissioner Walker. Um, what about media partnerships or programs? Because I think it's really crucial to get to the decision makers Absolutely. of these, you know, videos and so on. Absolutely. Are they very proactive in trying to solve the problem? And you know, what do you think of censorship? I'm anti-censorship. This is okay. Thank you for asking yes. that. I am. This is not a moral conversation that I'm having, and I'm anti-censorship. What I am asking for is that we have more conversation. What we actually have right now is very. It's already censored. We already have a very limited conversation where we see the same tropes, we see the same stories of masculinity, we see the same stories of sexual access to women's bodies, we see the same visions of what female sexuality looks like, we see the same melding of sex and violence. We turn on CSI whatever, and there's another dead woman, and that's our entertainment for the evening. So I'm anti-censorship. We are right next door to Hollywood. It is my dream to get Hollywood more involved in this. I know Russell Simmons has finally been making some shifts at looking at black masculinity and the messages that are sent through hip-hop, um, and I think that a great deal could be done by asking Hollywood to get involved. Good luck. <laughs> yes, thank you. I think you've made a lot of really good points about the men. One thing I wanted to just sort of float is the idea that most of the men who are perpetrating these crimes have been abused themselves, and it's a, a cycle of violence that perhaps we also need to talk about intervening at you know, at a much earlier point. Yeah, absolutely. I, what I'm talking about is addressing men, but also talking to our boys and talking to our girls so that we all are able to have that language and that conversation very, very early on. Um, and understanding that there's a cycle of abuse is one component. Um, strengthening and empowering women is another component. And taking a critical look at masculinity and, and starting to shift the terms of that conversation is another component. Um, is there any attempt being made now to get these programs, any of these programs, into the schools uh, that you know of? You mean K through 12? Yes. In our economic climate? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. I teach I teach these issues at a university level, and what my students say is, "Why, why am I hearing about this for the first time? I'm 20, you know." And um, so I would very much like to see these programs get implement, implemented at a younger age. And commissioners, welcome. Yeah. And I think one of the issues, being an, a former um, educator, is that there's a lot of um, um, emphasis on standards in the in the classroom, uh, standardized tests, and so on. That really, there's no criteria or strand that says sexual awareness that students, you know, 80 percent of students will score at or above proficiency right. level in this, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and so on. So you know, it's really difficult for teachers. But when I was, you know, um, a teacher and I was a director of technology, w a way of blending it in in the language arts curriculum and so on would be that media literacy that you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, really critical analysis. And if you use Bloom's taxonomy, you know, the higher levels of, you know, thinking and teaching, um, you know, there's really ways of really integrating that in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, think I wish they develop more resources. Yeah, and I think this conversation here is toward that end. I mean, this is where it starts, and then we can start thinking about strategies for really getting it into the schools. And I appreciate that point because I do think framing this as sexual assault literacy, the parents would be saying, yeah, you know, I what know. are you doing? If we start talking about media literacy, exactly, yes. then we can start talking in our schools. Technology literacy for the 21st century. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Any other comments or questions? Um, another one. I'm, I'm curious as to the impact of cultural factors in terms of, you know, these, the whole gamut of um, intertwined <laughs> uh, 
um, reasons or causes or origins of some of these, um, uh, you know, concept about men. But it, what do you mean? Um, are are there um, cultural factors that's associated maybe in the formation of some of these archetypes about men? You mean in terms of race or ethnicity? Is that yes, what you uh -huh. mean? Um, some people say that, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, I think that that it, that serves to um, it serves to really cover up the real issue. It doesn't make it acceptable, and I don't think it's off limits. Just because somebody says, oh, I come from a macho Latino culture, uh -huh. then let's right. talk about that. Let's talk about what macho really means. Macho really means doing the right thing and standing up. And what does it mean to really be tough? What does it mean to really speak up? Being tough means really speaking up. So we can start to rethink those issues. Right. I just wanted to build on that point about not utilizing sort of culture as almost like this curtain that you put mm -hmm. over it. Um, one of the really interesting things was the UN uh, special report on violence against women specifically identified a strongly patriarchal culture as a high risk factor for violence against women. So the risk factor in terms of culture would be patriarchy, not necessarily any particular ethnicity or race, actually. And Ms. Haddad, can you define for our viewers, you know, what patriarchy is? Sure. It would or be what a are the descriptors? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't planning on having this conversation. But okay. <laughs> You're so well versed on that. Yeah. Predominantly what we're talking about is a highly traditional gender role breakdown in the family and in society. So you have women who are relegated to the private sector, whereas men take up most of the space in the public sector. You have a high emphasis, maybe sometimes a strongly religious no matter what the religion is, a strongly religious bent to the community, um, and then a, a real focus on traditional gender roles. So, mm -hmm. so men really leading the upper echelon. Yeah, the head of the household kind of yeah. thing. So. And I would add to that um, ideas about, about power as power over others Absolutely. and wielding power over others, understanding power in that way is part of patriarchal culture. As that opposed to power with or right. power Power sharing. with or in relation Within, to yeah. or... Mm -hmm men being in the power roles. Um, thank you for um, this discussion. I appreciate this. And um, uh, I think one of the easiest solutions to this would be for teachers to be listening and work this into their curriculum. I remember when I was teaching as well in our English classes uh, that w uh, one of the um, parts of the curriculum was to take current music mm -hmm. lyrics and write, explain what the, what the lyrics were saying. And I remember a friend of mine was an English teacher and she got the best uh, feedback from students in assignments like that um, than she did in any, in any other uh, curriculum. So uh, hopefully there are some teachers out there watching and if we can't uh, spend money on programs and um, equipment, technology, we can at least build something into the curriculum in the English classes. Um, even in the PE classes, I mean, uh, we can take time to talk and discuss issues like this. And uh, that would be um, so helpful, I think, to a lot of uh, young, young uh, students that we have. Yes. And and just to follow up on that as well, I'd like to add that beyond K through 12 and the work that we're doing in the universities, um, that we can add public agencies. There, there's the police department and <laughs> programs. There are people, Jackson Katz does this for a living, that he comes and speaks to the Marines, to um, national, <clears throat> you know, NFL teams. NFL teams, um, groups like that, and so there are those opportunities as well. Well, I noticed Sergeant Feely was taking notes, so maybe he got <laughs> some of this information down. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, coming tonight and speaking to us on Thank you for uh, this I issue. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Next item, please. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is oral comment. Discussion is limited to items not a part of the agenda. The time is limited to an amount to be set by the chair. The commission may question or respond to a speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. And I believe you have two cards. I chair. have two cards and we'll limit you to five minutes each. Uh, first is Camille Levy from Glendale Healthy Kids, the director. Good evening. Good evening and thank you. 
Um, in addition to being Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April is also Child Abuse Prevention Month as well as Children's Month. And so we um, at Glendale Healthy Kids are very concerned with the well-being of our kids. Hence, it is also Glendale Healthy Kids Month in the city of Glendale. Um, we are at midpoint of Glendale Healthy Kids Month. Um, we kicked it off, and on Saturday we'll be holding our first ever children's health fair with all kinds of screenings and testing, uh, health testing for children, in addition to fun and games provided by the YMCA. On April 29th, and I invite you all, um, there is some information in the packets, uh, to join us as we celebrate 15 years of Glendale Healthy Kids. Um, it will be at Glendale Memorial Hospital, and it will be a fun celebration. This year, we have again increased our um, units of service to the children of Glendale by 30% which means we continue to grow. On the one hand, it's a good thing. People have found us, and we're making kids healthy. On the other hand, it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes um, for our staff and for our volunteers. On April 18th, um, which is Saturday at our health fair, at 11 o'clock, we will be having our Losing It for the Kids Way Off. We truly believe and are looking towards a vision where every child has optimal health. And we as adults need to role model that optimal health. So we've embarked on a campaign, and in the next year you're going to hear about us trying to get the community to lose a ton <laughs> of weight. I provided you with body mass index calculators so you can take a look at yourself. And I've also provided you with an opportunity to change that lifestyle with a deck of 52 cards that has healthy lifestyle and healthy eating tips. So we're, we're here to support you in all of this. In addition, I do want you to mark your calendars for May 13th and our Taste of Downtown Glendale. Glendale Healthy Kids each year serves over 3,000 children in the greater Glendale area, and we only do it through the support of the community. We do not get government funding. And this is one of our fundraisers. It's a fun evening. I encourage you to taste and sample from those 31 restaurants in moderation. <laughs> okay? Um, we hope that and look towards a future when there will be no need for Glendale Healthy Kids, but I hate to say it. I don't see that time coming soon. And whatever we can do to support the work of the Commission in raising up all of our children to be healthy, we stand ready to do that. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you at our events. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, can you tell us how much the uh, tickets are for Taste of Glendale and how our listeners can, our viewers can get Tickets that, for the uh, Taste of Downtown Glendale are $25. Uh, that's for adults. Children 12 and under are $10. You can go to our website, www.glendalehealthykids.org. You can call our office at 818 Five four eight seven nine three one. You can go to the Alex Theater, to the Chamber of Commerce, and any number of individuals in the city of Glendale. And you can purchase tickets that night because sometimes it's kind of hard to plan amidst the soccer games and the family activities. So they will be for sale that night. And as that well. night they're for sale at the Alex Theater. They will be for sale at the Alex Theater, at Massage Envy, and at the other end at the Americana at Brand. And that's really exciting. You have a lot of uh, the restaurants at the Americana. That are we have a part. lot of restaurants, and there are a lot of new restaurants, changes that have happened over the last um, year on brand and around brand. So it's an opportunity to taste the culture of Glendale, the myriad of foods of, of Glendale. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Any other commission comments or questions? Do you have a question? You mentioned April 29th. Our uh, annual celebration, um, which is our... Um, we use it as an opportunity to um, recognize our providers of the year, um, both dental, ancillary, and, and medical providers of the year, and our volunteer of the year.
um, our Helping Hand of the Year. And this year we are going to be recognizing our founders who founded us, sat at that table 15 years ago, as well as our past presidents. We are inviting, we ask that you RSVP if you're planning on coming. We want to make sure we have enough food for everybody. Um, but the community is invited to help us celebrate as well. So, so there's no tickets to buy? Or? There, It is absolutely free through the generosity of Glendale Memorial Hospital. And what time? Um, it will be from 5.30 until 8. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. I just have a Thank question you. about the uh, taste of Glendale. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there's a, a number of restaurants. Uh, so you have to go to each restaurant? Is there? You don't a have to. Okay. Well, I mean, that, would, that would be the only way you would taste it, right? The sample well, way. it would. You get a wristband, okay. and you are free to walk at your leisure to visit the restaurant and take a look at the ambiance in the restaurant. We have some individuals who make it to, I think, two, and that's where they stop because they like the food. We have others who have a goal of making it to each and every one. Okay. The flyer didn't have a, a time on there. At least I'm not seeing it. It's uh, 5.30 to 8.30. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That ever popular five thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, good luck. Thank good you. luck. Thank you, Camille. Our next speaker is Carol Ann Burton from the YWCA. Hello, commissioners. It's my pleasure to be here, and I uh, am pleased to remind everyone about our shared project that's coming up on Friday, Take Back the Night. We are going to be starting at the YWCA. We're going to have the clothesline project as well as a shoes event where uh, unfortunately many stories are there to be told of the domestic violence and the sexual assault. We are pleased to have Camille Levy speak as part of the program. Uh, from the Y, we're going to then walk down Glendale Avenue to Parker Center. And uh, last week, we reminded the politicians they're coming out to wish us good luck and speak. And then we will be walking back to the YW. The nice thing this year is we've arranged for there to be parking at the Y, so people who start walking will start, come down, and go back, so you don't have to walk back to your car after you've marched. <coughs> and we're looking forward to this, and we're very pleased that we're partnering with you all on this event. As Additionally, I would like to say that I hope you've all received your invitations on um, May 5th, we're having our annual legacy luncheon at the Castaways, and uh, we're very pleased to be honoring uh, five lovely women, Ruth Charles, um, Kathleen Powers from Glendale Healthy Kids, Janet Killian from Burbank, Mercy Veliquez, and Sandy Schultz, and our keynote speaker will be uh, Denise Hamilton. And we hope that all of you can come out and support us that day. And that's May 5th at the Castaways from 11.30 to 1.30. And to get tickets? I have, uh, hopefully you guys received yours, but I have more. I have mine. That can be, I know. <laughs> yes. So I will Ready to share go. those with you. And okay. And the, and the public can uh, The public like can contact go. us at the YWCA if they are interested in buying tickets. Right. And we will set them all up. Thank you. You have a wonderful group of women that you're honoring, and uh, it'll be a really nice event. And uh, I'm sure that you'll have several of us there. Thank you. Uh, thank very you. Much. Um, I have a question. Yes. Does um, the YWCA, do you get government funding? How, what's the basis of your funding? I wish that we could say that we didn't have to rely on government funding, but uh, we are still at about 60% governmental funding, mm -hmm. which does mean that we uh, fall under great scrutiny and we are audited. You have to dot all the I's and uh, cross all those T's and do a lot of yes sir, yes sir, and <laughs> thank you. And uh, we would love to shift that balance 
uh, because an organization like Glendale Healthy Kids that can yeah. do non be yeah. self sustaining, it makes it a lot easier uh, to run all the programs that you want. And unfortunately, it means that when you have governmental funding, especially in a in a recession and with government budgetary problems in Sacramento, we get the trickle down effect. So it has affected us this year. I heard there's a stimulus plan for you guys. You think so? <laughs> I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Burton. Dr. Next item. Next item on the agenda uh, uh, is the consent item for a approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting held March 9th, 2009. Any corrections or additions to the minutes? Uh, yes. In the roll call, I'm not listed. Okay, we'll make that correction. Any others? Um, item two, introductions, presentations. Um, Nina Nielsen was not here. She was absent. Right. But that was the title of the item. So it's oh, I see. So that's that's okay. To, that's okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Do I have a motion to accept the min uh, the uh, minutes as presented, as corrected, actually? I move that it be accepted as amended. Well, I'll second it. Okay. Do we have unanimous consent on that? Next item, please. Agenda item 5A1 is the uh, Commission Master Calendar of Events with a motion to providing direction regarding the Master Calendar. Okay. Any uh, discussion from the commissioners? Has there been a speaker uh, scheduled for May? We're looking at a specialist who's confirming with us regarding osteoporosis for Healthy Bones Month. Would you be open to a second doctor? Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to uh, suggest that Dr. Richard Dale, uh, part of that in May, provided that he's still available. We'll check with uh, the chair and see who, whichever doctor is able to come in first. I think two doctors presenting might be... Right, yes. So we have one request out to a doctor at Glendale Memorial. Because I know that I made the suggestion a month ago with uh, Chair Devine. Okay. Okay, well, we'll see which doctor... Uh, well, I really don't want to first. send out the invitation if... Oh, well, then we'll wait for this uh, doctor at Glendale Memorial to... Uh, and to then RSVP. if not, can we uh, prioritize the other doctor for June? Yes. Yeah. Hmm? Is he a, is he a specialist? Is he an osteo Oh, doctor? yes. He, he's, he's done a uh, national study that's very important to this as, as far as uh, also to teach people how to manage... Um, their bone health prior to having osteoporosis. So I think it would be a compliment to who you may have. The reason I was asking is because June is a different focus, so I yeah. don't know if May. we wanted to have yeah, right. two, two consecutive. I'll have to check with the chair and see. Okay. Yeah. But two Cause consecutive. I, yeah, because I thought I had received the confirmation that it would be okay to have that doctor. So I, I think if we can fit both of them and if it's, you know, you give them time constraint. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be better to have them in the month of May, yes. where the theme is yes. um, definitely. Uh, what, what we can do, I think, is just um, see which doctor is available, so that we can make the schedule and uh, schedule him, and then because uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we're saying, well, if he can come, we'll schedule him. So we'll see which. If we get a confirmation, okay. that's the one we'll. Uh, We'll use for now. And if the other one comes through towards the end, then um, we've had two speakers tonight, and I think mm -hmm. that worked yes, out just fine. Okay. Okay. Um, on the ACCW meeting, we're not hosting, correct? LA Commission correct. is hosting, so, so that's that should be corrected. And that's the one in August. Okay. No, May. No, May. May. Okay. So this is happening. Did they confirm whether it's happening? At um, Burbank or the LA area? Uh, all I know is what was, what did you hear on the conference, the that ACCW? They said that they were going to check. And we'll be hearing from them where it is. Sadad? I think I've received a notification, but I think it was still temporary, that it was LAX, a room at the airport, actually a conference room at the airport. So I'll yeah. look and send out the information as soon as I receive a final invitation. Okay. I, I have a question about the, um, the NACW con convention in July. Um, how do we handle that? Because I'd like to 
check on airline tickets and get into the, the uh, discounted hotel rate before it gets too close to it. That actually requires, um, at this point, all non-essential travel for the city due to the budget has been um, canceled, so we need specific administrative review from the city manager. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to take that forward for you. I haven't received any information about the conference, I think, though. No, I have. I, you did? Yes. Can you forward that to me, and I'll send it forward to uh, the city. The CEO. Yeah, you could just go online, and there's a registration form there. Okay. Yeah, it has it. Okay. Any other corrections or questions? Anything to add, commissioners? Okay. Do we need a motion to approve uh, the calendar as adjusted, amended? I so move. I'll second. Okay. We have consensus. Yes. Yes. Okay. Next item, please. Agenda item 5A2, consideration and approval of the um, <coughs> sponsorship for National <coughs> Vigil for Hope with a motion to provide direction regarding sponsorship of the National Vigil for Hope 2009. This time I'd like to invite the West Coast co-chair, Dr. Kathy Mathis, to approach the podium and discuss a little bit with you about this event. Okay. A familiar face. Good evening, Good Commissioners. Evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here this evening. To present to you the National Vigil for Hope, I am honored to be the West Coast co-chair. And the National Vigil for Hope is not a fundraising event, it's an awareness event. And it is, the focus for it is to bring awareness to the missing children and adults that are in our country today that are, as you all know if you've been watching the news, on an increasing number. Um, we know that in the last probably two months, We've seen Stephanie Condon case, the Duncan and Jack Lichtenberg case, the Sandra Cantu case, and the Amber Dubois case in San Diego that have made the news because these children were missing and found. Unfortunately, they were found dead and not alive. Our philosophy at the National Vigil for Hope is that one person, one person missing is one too many. And as the West Coast co-chair, I've been working with our national co-chair, who is Michelle Bart, who is the founder and director of Helping Heroes, um, who has helped on some of these cases to try and help find these children. The National Vigil for Hope 2009 is a national coalition of businesses, organizations, and individuals lending a helping hand and a voice to those children and adults that are missing in the United States. We are proud to have partnered with the California Commission on the Status of Women, the Glendale Seroptimus International, <coughs> Hollywood Chapter of Now, the Glendale Police Department, um, about Senior Solutions, solutions Wit Entertainment, Mathis and Associates, and many other California businesses and organizations who are going to join our efforts to bring awareness to the community. The National Vigil for Hope will take place on Sunday, May 17th from 4 to 6 p.m. here in Glendale. There are many children and adults that are still unaccounted for, and it's going to take all of us working together to keep these faces of the missing in the nation's eye so that they can be found. Our website is www.nationalvigilforhope.org, and I'm here to invite all of you to become a community partner with us in bringing this awareness so that these missing individuals can be kept in front of the community and the state so that we can bring them back to their homes. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the National Vigil for Hope and to invite you all to be a community partner with us on this important event. Thank you. Dr. Mathis, and um, so what you are asking of the Commission is um, a donation of $250 uh, for butterflies that will be released at the vigil. Absolutely. We would like to have the butterflies represent the missing. Missing. Uh, is there any discussion from the commission? I just have a question. Where in Glendale is going to be held? I didn't see a location. Uh, <laughs> astute question. Thank you. Good the, the reason there's no location listed is I couldn't go forward and schedule one before I got approval from the commission. So we have several that are being discussed. We, one of the one of the locations is the Parker Center where the flowers are in the city hall. Uh, the other one is still under negotiation. So I, I don't really want to put anything out there until we get a final final response. So are we also putting on the event as well? From what I'm hearing, we're just providing a location and okay. providing funding. 
the location and funding. Okay. And partnership. I'd love to put the commission on all our PR information. <laughs> of course, that comes with, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. What does our budget look like at this point? Because it sounded like there was a, there's a concern about the budget with the convention and maybe and we haven't gotten an update on Jewel, so how do we look at the travel funds don't come from the mon monies that are raised by the commission. So okay. um, that is a separate fund coming out of administrative funds, okay. and that's a di separate consideration. The money from the jewels has not yet been finalized, so that will be coming back uh, May, June at the latest. Uh, but the budget overall, you do have some room in terms of s substantial savings on different events that we've done, including our SAM month activities. So there is there's, is money available if you choose to allocate some. Uh, uh, Commissioner Walker. Um, approximately how much money do we have in our in our revenue account? In our revenue account? Roughly $20,000 that has been pre-allocated according to the budget that you have received back, I think it was in January. So the, the money, the budget was all laid out there. So you can go back and take a look and, and see the different um, events and how much was allocated for each one. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, a, it's a fairly tight budget, but we did ex exceed some of the revenue for the jewels, so. Any thoughts on the the uh, the event, Commissioner Pillsbury? The event sounds like a great event. I was wondering about two hundred and fifty dollars for butterflies. That sounds um, <coughs> flying away. <laughs> 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 I mean, I didn't know if there might be better how many butterflies? better ways to spend two hundred and fifty dollars. That's for about three hundred butterflies. And that was the lowest price I found on the internet when I was looking. I'm actually trying to get them for free, yeah, but haven't been right. haven't been too successful at this point in time. No butterfly farms for them. I guess yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, questions? I, I think this fits into the um, our program, especially because it um, it actually is directly linked to human trafficking. Um, missing children, missing women, um, etc. So I, I think it's um, it would be a a good event for the commission to be involved in. I think the question now arises is if we want to spend two hundred fifty dollars for butterflies to be released. I think that's a beautiful uh, symbolic gesture. Um, and uh, so, do we have any further discussion on the? Two, yeah. Are we ready for a vote? Uh, Mr. Walker. Are there other opportunities for partnerships that doesn't involve butterflies? For the National Vigil for Hope? Uh, well, you can just partner with us on the event, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, other line items that you may need assistance on yeah. other than that? Um, well, there might be. Um, <laughs> maybe tables at the event or microphones and speaker. You know, we could we could okay. do that type of thing as well. To the tickets or there, it's free. Oh, it's free to everybody. Oh, because you mentioned t tables. Yeah, um, tables for for flyers. There's going to be. Uh, we're having a uh, organization that does fingerprinting for children. Oh, They're yeah. going to come and do fingerprinting for children. There's supposed to be an organization there that does safety seats, uh, car seats for children. So there's going to be different. Uh, people there with information and things going on to help protect the children in so, our community. Uh, Dr. Well. Mathis, then this is a this is a part of the vigil that you haven't had um, um, a success in funding. Is that right, you right. I us? have I have uh, gotten on the internet and called the the <coughs> companies. Now I have to tell you, there was one when the East Coast chair beat me to one. When <laughs> butterfly group and they're getting theirs for free. I'm still trying, but I can, you know, just in case, I was hoping that you know that might be something we could partner on. Ms. Haddad, uh, in response to the concern that Commissioner Pillsbury sort of expressed, one of the things is if we are going to have tables, there will be labor involved in that, and that labor fee is not able to be waived by the Parks Department, and that usually comes to anywhere between 150 to 300 dollars, depending on the length of the event. This is a two-hour event, so we'll have staff there for two hours plus. Uh, the setup and takedown of the um, items, so that actually would be about two hundred and fifty dollars in terms of the labor cost. So, if you're also looking to include butterflies, I would actually allocate additional funding for that. Or we're going to. So, so you're you're saying that we should we would have to uh, donate more than the two hundred and fifty. If you are interested in in the, the location, be, yeah, because Parks Department has to charge for labor. They just they can waive some of the fees that they charge us, but they have to charge for labor. So. The butterflies are wonderful. It's a really beautiful symbolic gesture. However, 
it is, it's, it's not a concrete sort of thing that we can, and we'd still have to pay for labor. We would, we would have to pay. The commission is... Or somebody would be paying for that labor. So it sounds yeah. as if... It's an, it's an either or or an all. I'm, I'm leaving oh, it see. up it's to all of you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Then yeah. I will open it to the... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. One, one last comment. Okay. There is an additional meeting May 11th before the, the actual vigil. So if you'd like to come back, we can explore it further. We can come back to the commission with a specific line item breakdown of what possibilities, and maybe you can decide at the May meeting at the level of support. Okay. I'd like to that, see more detailed information. Best. So by then you would really know what you uh, need the funds for and what we can allocate mm -hmm. the funds for? Okay. okay then... Um, do I need a motion for for that to bring it back to the next? Let's do to I have partner? a motion to bring it back to the next uh, meeting? Can I just, uh, Walker, I just want to ask comment. a question. Um, you mentioned that is, is this the one with the venue? You're still not sure where where it's going to be held. Mm -hmm. So would that be a factor to consider if it's going to be May? When is this? May seventeenth. Seventeenth, and then we're going to decide on the eleventh in terms of. Uh, telling the community where and well I think we can move forward with settling because it sounds as if there's pretty consistent interest from the Commission with regards to moving forward with the event the question at hand is whether it's going to be two hundred fifty dollars okay. or more so we know that we've got that as a base but it would probably be helpful to put that in, into a motion right okay do I have a motion uh, let me ask a question how many people do you expect to attend that's a very good question. Since it's the first time we've done it here, I really can't tell you. I know that um, there is a group in Orange County that's going to drive up here, and there's 300 members in that group. So you figure if you get 10 percent, that might be 30 people from there. I mean, I'm just going with the with the you know what the realities are. Um, I have a group of women who are domestic violence survivors and sexual assault survivors who are going to be coming. I have moms who have their children missing because of court battles and that type of thing that are coming. I'm probably, I'm expecting, I'm hoping, around 200 people. I'm just thinking of maybe a, a place that we can may, may have donated for your use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, And there will be media there as well. Media is coming. And I'm hoping that in your packets, if you notice Sweet Baby J, she's a singer. Um, I'm hoping that she will be performing at our event, too. I'm told that she will be coming, but I haven't heard it directly from her yet. So I'm hoping. Well, I, I would move that we support the event, but that we decide at what level, whether it's the 250 or the 500, and what it goes to at the next meeting pending further information. And I second that. I agree. Can we do a roll call, please? Certainly. <clears throat> Commissioner Katafian? Yes. Lamel? Yes. Manasarian? Yes. Pillsbury? Yes. Toby? Walker? Chair Devine? Yes. Okay. Thank you Thank all very you. much. We look forward to supporting this event. It Thank sounds you. like a good one. Yes. Next item, please. Next item on the agenda is a request from the City of Glendale Human Resources Department um, to request sponsorship of the Commission for our Take Our Daughters and Sons to Work Day. Um, last year, over the this is the 13th year that the, that the city has been hosting Take Our Daughters and Sons to Work Day, and it's really a day to bring um, and expose daughters to all different kinds of work that is, is done by their parents. So it, it, the origins of it were the Now Foundation founded it for Take Our Daughters to Work Day, and it's sort of expanded over the last 13 years. And what we um, would like to do is to request money actually for food for the children who arrive. The, the budget for the city is just stretched beyond capacity. So we're looking at food and possibly a little giveaway for all of the kids. Last year we had over 100 children participating. They all get a picture with the mayor. They come and sit down and hear and hear different presentations about different avenues of public service. Um, they talk to police and with our emphasis on, on non-traditional careers, also with uh, resume building skills and um, job interview skills. We talk to the kids about that. We have Verdugo Job Center come out and do a, a presentation for them as well. So this is an opportunity for the commission to um, also have a table. We have like a big fair for the kids downstairs um, in the Isabel parking lot. We have Parks and Rec, the Discovery Trailer come, uh, Fire and Police come. So we'd like to see if the Commission would like a table down there as well. So it's really an opportunity. that The money that they're asking for is approximately $500. <coughs> would be fine too. So it just depends. Okay, I'll open it to discussion. Commissioners? Walker? Um, 
approximately how many people or children participate in this event? The, the children are about 100. 100. Mm -hmm. And with their parents are also involved. So you have uh, about 200 people involved in the day. And Go ahead. Um, is there a mention about the table? Is there a cost for the table? To the commission? Yeah. Um, n not, n no. I mean, it's given to departments who are participating somehow in the, in the event. So if the commission decides to financially sponsor, we could have a table. Are we the only commission donating money, or are they getting monies from other commissions? No, they're not getting any money from any other commissions. I just help on the organizing committee, so they asked this commission to do have, has the commission done it before? Have we done it before? Yeah, have we helped sponsor it? No, help? although we have worked on Public Works Day here in the city, and we have done that before. This is the first time we're being asked to support this particular event. What uh, day is the 23rd? Is that a school day? Thursday. So Thursday. And so there's, uh, they have it worked out with the district on... on well, these are kids who come, who, whose parents work here, so they're not necessarily in the Glendale Unified School District. Oh, they I come see. from wherever their parents happen to live from. Okay. Um, any other questions? Go ahead. Goldfish. To the children, uh, normally they get a lunch, a healthy lunch. So it's either a chicken sandwich or, you know, a burger, and then they get all the games and activities, plus all the presentation, plus a, a picture with the mayor and a conversation with the mayor and different administrative personnel. I know that sounds fascinating to like fourth graders, but <laughs> it's actually really fun. And then, um, and then we also give them like a goodie bag of some sort. And this year, so many departments have cut back on the goodie bag. There's actually nothing to give the kids to take away outside of a certificate saying they're participating in the event. So, um, and that's part of the reason why it's coming here. So the 500, um, let's see, would include food, film, and certificates. Right. Okay, no, no gift bag or anything like that. Won't be that. a gift bag. We're looking at other options that we can possibly get donated as well. So, what film? Is it a film? Polaroid like film Polaroid for the camera. Like camera oh. film. Oh, I see. Which is so pricey. I, I thought they closed already. Polaroid? No. <laughs> They're still out there. At least we still have. We're still buying it. They, <laughs> they are. Company. They are. The company did really. Oh my gosh! Times are a changing, huh? I'm just I'm just wondering if if a photographer can take it digitally and because yeah. the kids are the the children of employees here they can just pick up their pictures when they're ready it would be so much more inexpensive <laughs> and we have a copy paper is expensive we have which, a copy of yeah. it yeah which we one is more uh, is would be less expensive the digital or the well part of the oh. fun for the kids is to get that picture immediately so that's kind of fun for them and then plus two it's a time issue on the back end of printing the pictures and then generally speaking that's how it's been given to them with the certificate at, at the ceremony with the mayor so that's how they've done it I'll be happy to I'll be happy to look into it in a different way if you'd like but I'm pretty sure that's how they want to go would it be possible to uh, furnish this, um, these supplies for less than $500, do it you could, think? It could be, and the commission can always state their support up in an amount up to 500 not to exceed 500 or something like that. Okay, cause With I think the understanding that I would try to keep it as low as I, possible. I'm of, of the feeling that 500 seems to be a lot um, for, for this event, and uh, <coughs> if we could maybe cut that in half, maybe $250, <coughs> we could do film and... Uh, food and that's still very generous. So it's much appreciated. Absolutely. Okay, Commissioner Walker. Yeah, um, that five hundred dollars that we're proposing, the initial proposal. What percentage of the event budget is that? It's actually the entire event budget. They don't have a budget oh, okay. for the event, so it's all it's all been. So it's all going to be sponsored by the commission and the status of women. Well, but the work is done in HR, so it's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So it, it's a partnership. It would be a partnership. I I also think it's a it's a good idea for us because we can also uh, be there mm -hmm. and be uh, kind of role model role models for the young girls that are there, and uh, um, I think it's a good presence uh, for them. So I I would be in favor of this. Do I have a um, any other Commission comments, questions. Are we ready for a a motion? So, go ahead, Mr. Commissioner Walker. Okay. Um, so I've heard like proposals for lesser amount, um, and do we know exactly what we're going to be sponsoring or spending the money on? You well, know, it's, we mentioned it's listed it here: food? food, film, and certificate. So whatever they can purchase for two, if we allot, let's say if we allot two hundred fifty dollars, it would be whatever they can 
purchase for $250, and then hopefully if they need more, they can get the funds somewhere else. Not necessarily from another commission, because I think this commission is the only one that uh, raises funds um, to help out on projects like this. So um, uh, at least we would be helping and would be a presence, and uh, it, it would uh, I think would be good for the commission to do, be involved in this project. Any other comments? Are we ready now for a motion? Does anyone have a motion? Put forward. Okay, so so it sounds like we have competing uh, <laughs> motions. <laughs> well, do we have a second on that motion for? Um, Yes, Commissioner Katefian, you're suggesting we do the five hundred dollar no, donation. Do we have a second on that one? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I don't know how this goes about the mine. only discussion that I the only comment that I have to Commissioner Katefian is because I I kind of feel leery of, of approving or, or seconding that is because I haven't seen what we have and don't have yet. So I'm not really too comfortable about our budget right now to be able to really freely say yes. Otherwise, I agree with you about the 500. It's really not that much to support another organization and whatever work they're doing, which is excellent. But but th that's why I'm, I'm more going with the 250 because that's safer actually for, you know, yeah. Okay. Okay. So... Um, point point of order, though. Okay, I think you're at Barpetian. If if you did receive a motion, it failed for lack of a second. So now you're looking for a different motion. Okay. Do I have another motion on the item? Commissioner Lamel, two hundred fifty. Do I have a second? I second. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Who seconded? Uh, I heard two. Walker. Okay. Let's I have a roll call, please. Katafian. If the majority is. Lamel? Yes. Manasarian? Yes. Pillsbury? Yes. Sobe? And Walker? Yes. And Chair Devine? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item on the agenda is on Sex Assault Awareness Month Activities 2009. As you know, this is our third annual Sex Assault Awareness Month uh, slate of activities. And once again, we are pleased to have kicked off this month with a resolution from the mayor declaring uh, April as Sex Assault Awareness Month and also um, April 22nd as Denim Day in Glendale. So we've got those activities underway. This Thursday marks the first of a three-week partnership with Assemblymember Paul Krikorian's office in presenting with SHIELD Self-Defense, Self-Defense Workshops for Women, uh, with the hopes that at some point we won't need them anymore, um, a la Dr. Tarrant. <laughs> and then on Friday is our Take Back of the Night March and Rally. And April 23rd, uh, 22nd is going to be Denim Day in Glendale. And uh, I want uh, to add that um, uh, our self-defense classes start this Thursday, and they will be ne the following Thursday and the following Thursday, so the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. And if we take Sergeant Feely's advice, we need these to empower women. So all of you out there, please come to the self-defense classes just in case you need them one day, God forbid. Um, I would also encourage uh, on the Take Back the Night March for any of you that are planning on coming, if you would uh, um, bring a sign or a placard um, with a message on it so that when we march, um, we will have the placards in hand. And then when we get back to the Y, what we'd like to do is, is decorate the yard with these placards that say things like, um, there's no excuse for abuse. Um, respect works, um, any kind of message that you can um, uh, think of or create that would uh, be appropriate for that event. Uh, do I have any comments, discussion from the co fellow commissioners on this item? Um, I actually sure. wanted to mention, um, we were thinking of doing or uh, we thought of having an event at Color Me Mine, so it could kind of be a art as healing contest. and. Um, 
we were thinking the purpose would be like I have the proposal ready so I could email it to you um, to provide kind of a comfortable environment in which victims of sexual assault and domestic abuse can partake in creative activities that will provide healing and more so an opportunity to express themselves through art and it would be open to YWCA um, victims of domestic assault and sexual abuse and um, Basically, it's a $25 p uh, fee per sponsored participant, and it would be open to anyone else who would like to attend. So we were thinking that the 28th of April would be kind of a good finale date, kind of close up the month. And it would also be a good way to have um, victims kind of come and be able to heal themselves through this event. And then we could also sponsor... Um, the victims and for everyone else that wants to attend they could pay the $25 fee and then we would have snacks available and maybe we could have that donated by a restaurant um, in the community or you know anyone that would like to donate it's just um, an idea and we have a flyer and is this a program that has to be agendized since we I mean we don't yeah. we haven't heard about this and so it would have to be agendized and that would be for next month and that would be too late so this Just is a, um, an item that needed, you know, uh, earlier or agendized before the meeting. It's a good idea. It's a great idea. Commissioner Walker? Yeah, just as background, I think the last meetings that we've had, we've kind of involved and in, um, given the charge to our student ex officios to think of ways on how to involve the youth and the community and to um, give proposals on um, uh, enriching some of these activities well and so that's, yeah. that's actually actually we did do that but we gave them parameters we talked about the placards and we talked about an essay contest <laughs> we did not speak about something like this mm -hmm. so um, it really is something that uh, we need to have um, a little bit of a uh, um, heads up about uh, Ms. Haddad, can I address the chair? Sure, student? absolutely. Uh, Commissioners Malaki and Marquette, thank you so much for the input that you did do for the Art as Healing. One of the components of the Closed Line Project is precisely Art as Healing. And so what we can do is I'd be happy to connect you with the volunteer coordinator at the YWCA. Her name is Shake Gazarian, who coordinates precisely that event. And maybe you can work with her and maybe staffing the, dip the event as it goes on that night on, on the 17th. So I know she's been working with the, um, the residents in their shelter. So perhaps I can connect you with her. I'll send you an email, send her an email with your contact information. Okay, that would be great. Okay, that way you can start working mm -hmm. on it right now. And next year it's a brilliant idea. Let's take it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And what happens is they have T-shirts available at the Clothesline Project. And they have paints. And everyone and anyone can go and, and paint uh, their own shirt. Okay, with the message on it. So that that would be a great way of you doing that. Okay, good. Okay, um, Commissioner Maricott, you were working on another a project. Do you want to give us a little report on how the high schools are coming along? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, I have a combination of good news and bad news. Um, bad news fair. Bad news first. Um, should okay, never mind. <laughs> that was epic fail on my vocabulary. Um, but anyway. Um, I've tried to pitch the idea of the creative project contest at my school. However, unfortunately, y we need Senate approval, and Senate only meets four times a month. And um, ever since we started working on this project, we already missed two of them. So, and the next meeting is tomorrow. And I will pitch it then, but it's unlikely that we will get the projected number of attendees. But what I did do is I did email the um, the principals of both Glendale High School and Hoover High School, and um, unfortunately, right now they are on spring break, so um, I'll probably only get a reply by Monday. And if the creative project contest doesn't work out, I'll surely publicize the denim day, which will also require Senate approval. But at the same time, I do have the contacts of Glendale High School and Hoover High School, and I did leave my phone number and my email for them to get back at me, and I do have posters, like, lying around my house. Great. And I want to commend you for going to City Council last week. That was a very good presentation that you made, made with Commissioner Manassari. And, um, so you, uh, you're going to um, send this out to the different high schools. And the Denim Day won't be a problem because it's on May 22nd. You, I mean, um, April 22nd. So you have a lot of time for that one. Um, how about um, 
getting um, some of the high school students to come to the march? Do you think there'll be any um, uh, success in that? Um, si- um, <laughs> I have a problem because my prom yeah. is that day, and um, I could surely publicize it for the freshmen and the sophomores, but um, in terms of people who are my age and older within my high school, not so much. So this is an all-around bad day, bad <laughs> yeah. day for uh, high school students. Okay, all right. Well, we appreciate the fact that you tried. That, that was, uh, I mean, you've done a, a yeoman's job, and we appreciate everything <laughs> that you've done, and we look forward to the denim day that you, uh, you bring about at the high schools. Okay, any other commission comments? I, I just really want to, um, you know, laud the efforts of our student ex officios yeah. um, in taking, you know, these ideas. Um, and I know I kind of mentored them on the side, but it's really, you know, their ideas on, you know, how to put together, you know, these things. And it, it was a lot of work, I know, <laughs> communicating with with the youth, you know, with their peers and getting, you know, um, ideas. And we'd really like to see more of these fresh ideas coming from um, our student ex-officios. Good. So we're all set for Thursday night self-defense and Friday the march, and I hope to see a lot of people there. All righty. Next item, please. Agenda item six, commissioner and staff comments. Okay. We'll go around the dais and... Uh, I welcome any of the commissioners who have comments to make them at this point. Uh, shall we start with Commissioner Katepian? Yeah, uh, today's uh, agenda was quite uh, different types of uh, items, <coughs> and it was a nice. Uh, it, there was a nice presentations for different subjects that we had on the agenda. And then, viewers uh, of Glendale, I wanted to comment people, especially who work very hard on this. Asian. Congratulations for it. Especially the people who work very hard. Mr. Lumel? Um, I came in a little bit after the the video was shown of Honorable Karen Bass. I just want to thank her office for putting together that video on such short notice since she was unable to attend due to the budget. But she did have a, a rep- representative there. And um, I was uh, hoping that we'd have our update so we can really get into thinking all those that were a major part of making it a success, especially a lot of the congratulatory letters that we received from elected officials from across the country. But I would like to congratulate our new city council or city council members and um, also the school board members as well as treasurer and and. Um, and, uh, and uh, I think a city manager was also College yeah. Board. College Board. Oh, the, College board. the College Board, yes. And um, I think that that was just a, a, a very interesting change of, of, the, of the changing of the guards, and uh, we look forward to uh, a, um, maybe taking the city in a different direction. Mr. Manasseri. I wanted to thank Joe for coming to the city council meeting, and she had wonderful posters made up, and she was excited when she made the presentation. And I wanted to thank her for all the effort and what she did. And so, you know, just keep up the good work, and thank you very much, Jill. So, thanks, Mr. Pillsbury. I would like to read a letter from Natalie Profant Kamuro, who is the executive director of Path Achieve. On behalf of Path Achieve Glendale, I wanted you to know that the residents in our emergency housing program truly appreciated the delicious food recently donated from the Jewels of Glendale event. Path Achieve Glendale, which is located in South Glendale, serves 1,500 homeless people each year in our case management and residential programs. Each night we shelter 40 men, women, and children in our emergency housing program. We are very fortunate to have volunteer guest chefs who prepare and serve meals for our clients, but from time to time we have cancellations. Donations of additional food can make up for missed meals, allow us to provide lunch for clients to take with them, or to provide a meal for hungry people seeking services in our access center. We are glad to help keep good food from going to waste. 
for anyone interested in supporting us either with coordinating the delivery of donated catered food or with a monetary donation, please contact me at 818-246-7900. Again, thank you for thinking of us. Sincerely, Natalie Profant Camoro. Mr. Walker. Similarly here, I want to congratulate our newly elected officials, um, particularly um, Ms. Council, City Council Member Laura Friedman, who's um, new in the commission, and we have um, Mr. Frank Quintero and Aaron Ajarian. And um, also, Faybag is having its, Wednesday, its um, April Mixer on April 29th. And that's a Wednesday from 6.30 um, onwards, because we're going to be having our um, post-election victory celebration, too, and um, inviting uh, the elected officials. And this is through the partnership arm of FABAG, which is FABAG PAC, or the Political Action Committee of um, FABAG. Commissioner um, Malakian? I just wanted to say that uh, the Jewels of Glendale, I thought, was really great. I I had a great time and I got a lot of good feedback. Um, and I was also wondering if I could get a picture emailed to me so I can maybe incorporate it into an article I'm writing about the event for Oraga newspaper, Armenian periodical. So um, yeah, I was wondering if I can get that. And I thought it was a great event and I'm really excited about um, Take Back the Night. So, Mr. America? Um, I wanted to thank both of the speakers. They were awesome because I heard like two different perspectives on um, sexual assault and it's just nice to think of things in so many different aspects. So um, I like seeing that. And also, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm really sad that I wasn't able to publicize the whole assault awareness a month, month as much as I would like to. But um, just know that I'll be back on my grind and I'm going to um, I'm going to work hard to publicize it around the high schools and stuff and I will I will spam those emails you know <laughs> no we don't want to use spam <laughs> that's okay we will e-blast <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you I'm sure you'll do the best that you can <laughs> Uh, my comments are, uh, first of all, um, at the Brand Library, there is a very powerful art exhibit. It's called Man's Inhumanity to Man. I want to congratulate um, the members of the Arts and Culture Commission who were able to pull this together, uh, particularly Rasmic Gregorian, um, Armin Kevanian, and Arlette de Hovenesian. Uh, it's a as I said, it's extraordinary and it's uh, moving. Uh, it is still at the Brand Library. On, on April 15th, they're going to have a music and poetry uh, session from 7 p.m. to 8. And on Saturday, the 18th, all day, they're having arts and thoughts, a day of art and thought. But uh, mostly just to congratulate the Arts and Culture Commission for a, a wonderful, wonderful um, art exhibit. Uh, an update on Habitat for Humanity, the women's build here at Kenwood. They are now in the construction aspect, so if any of you out there want to volunteer to drywall or do any of that kind of um, work at Habitat for Humanity, you can make your phone call. The finishing aspects, which I'm interested in, and I'm hoping that the rest of the commission will be interested in, the painting, the planting the flowers, and beautification of the uh, the finishing of the um, women's build uh, will be starting in December or January. So uh, if anybody's interested in calling to volunteer, the number is 626-387-6899, and you'll want to talk to Brittany. And uh, they have... Um, uh, Spots uh, for sing, uh, you know, for individuals all the time. So you can just call her and uh, and uh, go down and and volunteer. Um, I was also um, privileged to attend the 25th anniversary celebration of the ARS Western Region, and I wanted to congratulate all the members of the Armenian Relief Society. This is a group of women uh, who who do a 
supply services for women and families here in Glendale and in Armenia, and they do a wonderful job, and uh, I was honored to attend that anniversary celebration. I also went to, um, attended the grand opening of Assemblyman Paul Krikorian's new office in, the re in Burbank, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because uh, I would like everybody to know that he has one staff person who does nothing but walk door to door in his district asking people what the issues of most importance are to them. So uh, I, I applaud him for this service and I um, would like for all of you to know that if you have an issue and someone comes knocking at your door from Paul Krikorian's office, please be sure to let them know because he is interested and uh, I, I think it's great that he does that. Uh, the Glendale Garden Tour is coming on Sunday, May 3rd. It's the walking tour of private gardens in the Verdugo Woodlands this year. And if you don't know about the Verdugo Woodlands, you, you should really do this garden tour because it is the most beautiful part of Glendale. Um, I walk there twice a week, and the homes and the gardens are phenomenal. Um, after the... the um, uh, the tour, uh, there is a water conservation presentation. The tour uh, tickets are $25. It is an all-day event. Uh, the num it, all the funds go to the Cancer Wellness Program at Glendale Adventist Hospital. Um, so if you're interested in tickets, please call 409-8100 for that garden tour. And finally, I also want to add my congratulations to the newly elected officials in the recent election. It was a particularly good day for women. Laura Friedman became the first woman to win on her first attempt at city council. And she's the first woman since Ginger Bremberg in, I think it was 2000 or uh, something like that, to hold a seat on the city council. We wish her the best. Also, women made inroads on the school board and the Glendale Community College Board, and we congratulate all of them. Um, we're very proud and, uh, and look forward to, to seeing them in action. Um, with that, may, do I have a motion for adjournment? I so move. Second. Meeting is adjourned at 8.15.